You know, sometimes we'll be somewhere where we see a, a can or something that says, warning contents under pressure. And uh, I find that we live in a society at a time where that really can be labeled over our heads, especially in this area. People are constantly under pressure. And it seems that we really can't, we're not the kind of people that can really rest. Even when we rest, we're always thinking about things that we have to accomplish. And I find it amazing because if I was only to hear, let's say, you know, adults doing that is one thing. But I even hear kids talking that way where they, they want, you know, they just can't imagine just sitting around doing nothing. They got to do something and they got to go from one thing to another. And uh, that's the generation that's being raised up around us as well. We're going crazy. And, uh, you know, there are, there are things that studies that talk about stressful time. The most stressful time of the year is between Thanksgiving and New Year's. If you think about it, it's so stressful. You're thinking, all of a sudden you begin to think about Christmas. You know, I heard my first Christmas music this week, and I was listening to it, 99.1, and I started putting Christmas music. I was like, that's a little too early for me. Don't do that. But all of a sudden you're hearing Christmas music. You start thinking about all the gifts you have to buy. You start making, you know, like Santa, you start making that list, checking twice, Take out the naughty ones. You don't want to give them. But you start plotting all that. And you have to go, you know, all these parties. You know, we have Thanksgiving. We had Thanksgiving uh, dinner here yesterday. Now you're going to have Thanksgiving dinner with your family. You're going to be traveling around. You're going to be doing this, that. And my goodness, you begin to worry about the finance. You begin to worry about all those things. You worry about that relative that you have to deal with again this year. And you're like, oh, Lord, please give me patience. You know, you think about so many things. And of course, some of us have even begun to think about our waist size. Oh my goodness, we're expanding here. You know, I stopped growing this way, but I'm growing this way. I don't like that. I want to shrink back, lose a few pounds. But as I was telling a friend, you know, we won't make these commitments until after the New Year's because we know how difficult it is to keep them. We have our day-to-day -day stress. We're constantly be stressed out with so many things. I mean, think about it. We even start our days with our alarm clock. It's, never, it's not called a comfort clock. It's an alarm clock. And most of them are pretty annoying in their sound, you know. And if you want to wake up, you normally have something that annoys you. If you have something that's sweet, you might stay in bed a little longer and just enjoy it. We jump out and we begin to begin our day. And what do we put on? Normally TV we, or we put on the radio. Or maybe you're driving to work and you're listening to the radio. And what do you hear? Horrible, terrible things going on in the world. And you get even more stressed. You start panicking about everything. So much so that I saw a cartoon recently. I thought it was hilarious. It said, you know, uh, there's a TV and the, and the guy on television say, there's so much fear, so much terror, so many things, how are we going to handle it? And the guy sitting there shuts off the TV <laughs> and he smiles. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, because bad enough that we have all the stress, but then when we listen to TV, think about it. They get you stressful. Now, of course, I can hear Nancy. She's talking to me. And she says to me, we need to be educated. And she's right. She's absolutely right. We need to be educated. But we need to make sure that we balance watching the news which, with reading the Word of God. Because if all you're taking in is the things of this world, then you're going to be super stressed. And you're going to have a great deal of anxiety and no resolution. You know, when I, when I see these things and I was being engulfed by them, the Holy Spirit just brought to my mind from Jeremiah, do not fear the things they fear. You know, we get fearful of the very things that the people in the world are afraid of. Do not fear what they fear. But if TV cannot be controlled that way for you, then it's best for you to shut it off. But the fact is that we have these behaviors that we have learned to be worry wards, to be people that are anxious. And this morning, as we are thinking about Thanksgiving and we're preparing to have turkey and enjoy that time with family, I want to share with you a message that will help us to focus in on what's important. And Paul here tells us Three things that I want to focus on. The first one is not to worry about anything. Look at verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But as soon as I tell you that, you begin to get anxious. It's like someone telling you not to stress, not to worry. You begin to think about all things that stress you and worry you. One person has called this the golden age of anxiety. Think about it. We have all kinds of anxieties. Micro anxieties and macro anxieties. We worry about ourselves and our own situations. We always worry. We worry about our community, our finance. We worry about the world that we live in. We have all kinds of worries. 
that continually wear upon us and drive us insane. And yet it's amazing how many of our worries are not really relevant. In a study, Dr. Calvert showed that 40% of the things that we worry about never happen. Never. At all. But we worry about them. So think about it. Out of the 10 worries that you have, four of them are completely meaningless. They will never occur. Yet 40% of our worries are about those things. 30% of our worries about things in the past. We're constantly worried about things that we cannot change. We cannot do anything about them. Yet we continue to waste our time thinking about them. You know, as a Christian, that should not be the case. Whatever your past is, there should be a sign over it says, covered by the blood of Christ. And it should be left there. But we still worry about, but, but think about it. If we got rid of that 40% and 30%, that's 70% right there. Talk about great economy. Now there's only 30% to worry about. 13 is health issues. Constantly, right? People's like, oh no, that something's wrong with me. Got to rush to the doctor. Oh no, oh my God. You know, oh, you know, and we, we worry so much. 13% of those worries are because of health issues. 10% are trivial worries, just day-to-day -day concerns about things. And he says, when you knock it all down, only 8% is actual legitimate concerns. Wow, 8%. But we take 92% and it overwhelms us because we don't put it in perspective. But of course, all that behavior about worry is a learned behavior. You weren't born worrying, but you learned to worry because that's the culture that we're raised in. Maybe we saw our parents always worried about this or worried about that, things that overwhelmed them. I remember a dear friend of mine, a sweet lady from this church, who a uh, very wise woman, very wise, very knowledgeable, and yet she was very honest with me. You know, I went to her home and I saw that she wouldn't throw anything away. I mean, if she, had, she bought shoes, she would keep the shoe box. She would not throw anything away. And I, so I said to her, how come? I mean, you know it's not, you really don't need it. Why do you keep it? She said, you know, Pastor, I lived during the time of the Great Depression. And we didn't have anything. And something was instilled in us at that time to keep everything. You just might need it, you know? Now, there is truth to that because I have got rid, got rid of some things and I'm like, Oh, wow, I need it now. I should not have gotten rid of that. But it's, it's amazing how, again, that culture that she came from so molded her, that despite the fact that she knew, all that, she knew she didn't need that box, but it was almost impossible for her, or well, it was impossible for her, to throw it out because she grew up in that. We learn to be worried. We learn to have these anxieties. And yet the Word of God speaks to us on how to deal with it. Jesus told us, so don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow brings its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. You know, don't be overwhelmed with all these things. Trust God. Trust the Lord. It's amazing. As being people of faith, it's amazing how many times we don't walk by faith. And we're so fearful of so many things, and we worry about so many things, instead of trusting the Lord to take care of our concerns. Now, I'm not saying don't do the things you're supposed to do, but don't over-worry about them. Don't be so consumed by them that you're not trusting God to take care of the things in your life. Well, here Paul tells us not to worry, but then he tells us how we can handle it. And the first thing he says, pray about everything. Look at verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, you might say, well, pastor, I don't have time to pray. Well, here's a solution. I got a solution for you. Take all that time that you're using for worry and pray. You know, when you're home and you're sitting there and you begin to worry about things, turn those worries into a prayer time. And instead of saying, oh, my goodness, how am I going to take care of it? I say, Lord, help me to deal with the situation. Help me because I don't know how to put these finances together. Help me because I can't figure out how to pay these debts. Help me because I have this, 
this problem that I'm dealing with. I don't know how to handle it. Turn your worries into prayer. Imagine, if you do that, you become like a prayer warrior. And it'll only be between you and God how you became that way. None of us will know that it was because you were a worry ward. Because you were constantly worried about everything. But you'll become a prayer warrior. But what a way to turn that energy around rather than being negative and worrying about things. Instead, lifting up everything in prayer. Paul says, in every situation, everything in our lives is important to God. Not just the big things. Sometimes people think only the big things are important to God. Oh, well, no, this is, this, is an, this is an important issue, so I'll bring it to God. This is not such an important issue, no big deal. God cares about every aspect of your life. God created you. He created you uniquely. And everything that pertains to you is important to him. So you might think that that toothache is not important to him. You might think the fact that you can't find a place to park your car is not important to him. You might think that many things are not important Everything in your life is important to God. And we are to bring everything in prayer to Him. Don't hold anything back. Don't start saying, oh, you know, start managing your own concerns. Say, well, I'll bring this, but not that. Maybe it's that very little thing that you need to bring to Him because you need to trust Him. Maybe we can trust Him in the big things because we have no control over it. But the little things we don't bring to Him because we feel we have control over them and we can handle it ourselves. Don't imagine that. Bring every situation to him. He's made you so unique, and he cares about you. Every aspect of your life. No matter how trivial it may seem to others. Maybe somebody else might tell you, well, that's not important. Why are you bothering God with that? Because God said I could. Because God cares. Beautiful verse. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Let him have all your worries and cares. For he is always thinking about you and watching out everything that concerns you. Wow. Bring it all to him, all your worries, all your cares, because he cares about you. Because he's concerned about you. So no matter what the enemy tells you, no matter what others may tell you that that's not important, God says, bring it to me. I care about every aspect of your life. And as I've said so many times, when we come to God, we don't have to worry if somehow he's not going to hear our prayers you know oh god is so busy he's listening to so many more important prayers than why would he listen to mine you know sometimes we treat god like somehow we're going to get a busy signal when we call him or get one of those automated things i hate those automated things don't you hate them oh I hate them you know your call is important please stay on the line and the first representative will get to you and I'm like, you know, I feel like I'm on Jeopardy. I hear the Jeopardy music in the background, you know, waiting for a reply. You know, 10 minutes later, I guess I'm not that important. <laughs> you know, 20 minutes later, you're like ready to give up. You know, I could go buy a new one by the time you answer this phone. You know, it's not like we're going to call and say, like, sorry, all of the angels are busy right now helping other Christians. You know, but if you stay on the line, or if you stay on your knees, a representative will be with you soon. No, no, immediately. As soon as you speak, you are in the presence of God. There is no barrier, nothing between us. It's as simple as beginning to talk. You know, and if you really don't have that moment, that day where you can really pray and have those 30, 40, 50 minutes alone with the Lord, make sure you're still talking to God. You know, I don't know about you. I mean, sometimes I guess I must look insane if I'm in my car and I begin to talk to myself. I should get one of those little things on my ear. I always thought, you know, at least they'll think I'm talking to somebody on the phone. <laughs> but just talk to God. You know, it's amazing that we feel like somehow if we don't really pray, we don't have those 30 minutes or whatever, that somehow we, we, we're not going to pray at all. We're not going to talk to God. You may not have the luxury of those 30 minutes, but you should, be able, you should be in a continual conversation with the Lord throughout your day. You know? Because it's true that we live in a society, again, where so many things come at us so fast, so quickly, that we're not able, you know, I might be doing something, and I say, okay, now I'm going to dedicate time to prayer. And no sooner do I get down on my knees to pray, while I'm talking to God, the phone will ring. Or my wife will call out saying, oh, someone needs to talk to you, or somebody's in the back door, someone needs to see you. And I'm like, oh, sorry, God, got to go. <laughs> and it's amazing how life can be so overwhelming. 
Some of you, I really don't know how you do it. Really. Amazing. If I had your schedule, uh, I'd be dead. I just, I, I don't. It's amazing. You really amaze me. You get up so early in the morning, you go to work, you come home so late at night. Then some of you have so many kids where I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm, I'm dealing with one and I'm like, oh my Lord, how do they do it? <laughs> you know, it's like, how do they, how do they keep up with, you know, with, with four when I can't keep up with the one? It's like, you know, it's like Olympic time here, you know, and all that anxiety. But, you know, I've learned that even in spending time with my daughter, when I'm down on the ground, I begin to talk to God. Not only am I talking to God about myself and the things, but I'm talking to God about my daughter. You know, and, and she sees me praying and talking to the Lord. And now, of course, when we, of course, when we eat, we always pray together. And she's learned to bow her head and say, you know, and then she'll say amen. And I'm like, yeah, teach them right. Teach them right. Teach them to know things of the Lord. Bring everything in prayer to the Lord. You know, we need to cultivate a life of prayer. You know, we might say, oh, okay, well, Pastor, I don't have time to study the Bible the way you study the Bible. Yes, but you do have time to pray. You can pray. And in prayer, we're in the presence of God. And we begin to deal with all these anxieties, all these things that we have. So Paul says, don't worry. Instead of worrying, pray. And he says, when you pray, give thanks. Look at verse 6 again. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Of course, we know that being thankful is very important. You see all these studies about thankful people are healthier people. Well, that makes sense. I've seen grumpy people. I've seen grumpy people who are walking around like everything is bitter. They, you know, amargo. That's a Spanish word. I like that. Amargo. They're bitter. You know? Everything, nothing goes wrong. No matter how good things go for them, they always look at the bad thing. Oh, I didn't get as much as I thought I was going to get. Oh, I didn't go as far as I may. I thought I was going to go. It's like, man, you're not grateful for anything. And yet grateful people, even in studies, worldly studies, they tell you they're healthier people. That gratitude is very important. That it helps your immune system. That it helps you all your health issues. And that alone, you should, you should say, wow, I should become a grateful person. Just learn. Even if I start practicing, you know. I always tell you, if you start doing it, you never know. You might just actually start saying really thank you. You know. But actually be grateful for things around you. For things that God has given to you. But as Christians, there should be no excuse. It makes sense that the world might be the way the world is. But our attitude should be, no doubt, one of thankfulness to God. If really, if you cannot thank him for anything at all, then look at the cross. Look at the cross. Because we take the cross for granted. It's almost like, a, a, like writing it off. We just take it for granted that we're saved by grace, praise Jesus, and that's it. No. That salvation costs a lot. It cost the blood of the Son of God. God saved you. God has been merciful to you. You would not even be able to be in the place where you are complaining about the things that you're complaining about if the mercy of God had not come to you. When I complain, it's very difficult for me because I know, even in my short time, I was only, I was only a non-believer for 14 years. That's why I'm working for Abby to be a full-time, all the time, from beginning to end, none of this started in the, somewhere in the middle. That's why I say, Lord, make sure she stays on that path. Once she gets that path, stays on that path. But you know, even as a non-Christian, making that transition, you know, your mindset is so different. And we have to have a mindset of gratitude and thanking God for all the things that he's done for us. And, and Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And the word in is very important. It doesn't say that we have to give thanks for all our circumstances. I see people doing that. That's always amazing to me. You know, they have a car, their, their car gets wrecked. Thank you, Lord, that my car got wrecked. Okay. I see someone's got problems. You know, their theology is a little bit warped there. You know, thank you, God, for this toothache. I don't think so. I don't think so. Although I am grateful to God for two things. You know, during a time that I was on vacation for one week, I was like, started getting this pain. And I thought it was my ear because I had a, one time I had a really bad ear infection. Once the weather gets cold, it begins to affect my ear. So I thought, oh, okay, you know, just put in a little cotton and we'll feel better. But the pain wouldn't go away. I said, oh, I got to go to the dentist. Got to make sure. 
Sure enough, I had a small cavity. But I'm grateful because if I didn't have that pain, I wouldn't know I have a problem. And I wouldn't seek to resolve the problem. So you still can be thankful for pain. Because think about it, we take it for granted. If we didn't feel the things that we felt, we wouldn't know there's trouble. And if we wouldn't know there's trouble, we couldn't be able to deal with it. But we can thank him in the midst of all those circumstances, not for the circumstances. You know, we don't thank God for the evil in the world. And I see certain people, you know, I was just talking to someone this week that has a, a very different view in their Christianity. And he was telling me that he believed that what happened in Paris was the divine will of God, that God wanted 129 people dead. I was like, wow, dude, your God's a very wicked God there. No, God permits those things to happen, but that's not the divine will of God. You know, so things, things are going to happen to us that are bad. The thing that God desires bad things for us, no, no, not, not at all. But they will occur because we live in a fallen world, and these things are going to happen. And we can thank him, not for the bad thing, but for the fact that even in the midst of the bad thing, God is always working. And we always turn to that promise in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. No matter what occurs within our lives, whether we can make sense of it or not, we are guaranteed by the word of God. We are promised by God himself that he is working in the midst of all that to bring about our good, to glorify himself. And of course, the good that he's working, we're told in verses 29 and 30, is to make us like Christ. It's to transform us. Everything that God is doing in your life is to make you more and more like Jesus. And even the bad things that occur, God's going to take them and use them to mold you, to make you like Christ. So no matter what you're going through, yes, we don't thank him for the bad things, but we can thank him in the midst of the bad things, knowing that he is still there and that he's working and he's going to continue to work within our lives. And Paul says, if we can do that, instead of worrying, if we can pray and be thankful, then he says in verse 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus replacing your anxiety with peace. That's a good trade-off. You know? Trade all your worries, all your anxieties for the peace of God. Wow. Who wouldn't want that trade? We think everybody would want that trade. Not everybody. There are people who feed upon their anxieties and their worries. And no matter how many times you try to tell them, don't worry. Trust God. They want to worry. It's almost like worrying makes them feel better. Either that they're alive or whatever, but it makes them feel better. Worries will only destroy your health, destroy your mindset, and they will give you a more negative aspect towards God because you'll wonder where is God in the midst of all this. But God says, pray, be thankful, and if you do that, I will exchange with you. I'll take your anxieties. I'll take your worries, and you take my peace. And that peace is not like the world. The world only gives a temporary peace that only lasts for that moment. You know, I'm always amazed when I read atheists, and I read them quite a bit, and they always try to make sense of things, and they can't. Because they realize in the end there is no sense, there is no meaning if there is no God. So no matter what, I mean, how can you speak to an evil situation? I remember reading this great book um, where the man was saying, you know, every time a tragedy happens, have you noticed when a tragedy happens, they always go to priests or pastors or rabbis and say, how will God respond to this? Have you noticed they never go to atheists? Now think about it. They never go to atheists. When a tragedy occurs, why don't they go to an atheist and say, well, what do you think is, what is the meaning of this? What are they going to tell you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it just happened. Horrible, terrible. Well, let's keep walking. There's no meaning. It just occurred. You can't see the working of God in the middle of that. You can't see the grace and mercy of God. You can't see anything in the middle of that. Because all I can say is that it happened. But there's no hope. There's nothing. 
That's why they don't go to them. But they go to the people who have faith, who have hope, who can see beyond the physical to the workings of God. And they're looking for that because they need that, at least at that moment. And God says, you can have that all the time. You can have that peace. You know, you're going to turn on your TV set, and maybe during this week there are many things that are going to bother you, whether in the news, whether the newspaper, where it is you're turning to, maybe within your own family, something that's going to make you anxious. You need to stop yourself and take that anxiety time and turn it into a prayer time. And when you're praying, be grateful. Think of the things you need to be grateful for. How many things we take for granted. You know, the Lord has blessed us in so many ways. And yet every single day, we take it for granted. And it's good when you're worrying to stop and be actually grateful. Thank, you know, thank him. You know, Psalm says, name your blessings, you know, write them down, you know, name them one by one. Sometimes that's a good idea. Because we do take them for granted. If you begin to write them down, maybe you realize just how many you have. And you'd be grateful to the Lord. And the Bible tells us if you can do that, the peace of God will reside with you. And indeed, what makes others frightened, what horrifies them, what scares them, will not scare you. Because your mind, your heart, will be at peace. But not because of you, but because of the peace of the Lord will abide with you. That's a beautiful trade. You know, and unfortunately, think about it. You can hear this message, and two days from now, you get overwhelmed in the things of this world, and you become anxious again. Or well, then you need to get back in the Word again. It means you're neglecting the Word of God. You're neglecting prayer. Don't let the things of this world overwhelm you. Focus on the one who has conquered and let him be the one that rules your mind and your heart. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your great mercy and love towards us. And Father, indeed, there are so many things that would make us anxious. So many things that are constantly being thrown at us to make us fearful of so many things. And Father, just... Help us to shut those things out and to hear the voice of your Spirit. To be able, dear God, to bring all our concerns, all our cares before you. And we praise you because we know that you care about everything within our lives. It is such a wondrous thing that the creator of the universe would be concerned about my needs. We are humbled by your love and grace towards us. And we thank you that indeed we can bring all things before you, and we do. And we bring them all before you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.